10. Who speaks the word? As we have seen, the doctrine of infallibility is not restricted to the Bible. Man is in all his ways and in all his being the creature of God. Every category of his life and thought is determined and conditioned by that fact. Man is therefore God's covenant-keeping man, or in a revolt, is a pretended God who seeks to reproduce God's being and life in his own person. Man will therefore, in his rebellion, seek to establish his independent word as the sufficient word. His autonomous word is said to be beyond good and evil, because his word establishes what is good and evil for himself, and for the moment only. Not even the word of existential man can bind him. In analysing the question of the infallible word, we must recognise that, in essence, there are three possible answers to the basic question of the ultimate and necessary word. How do we know and what is the source of authority? Who speaks the binding and infallible word in brief? We can answer, first, that man alone speaks the word. Second, that God and man are both capable of speaking the creative and ultimate word. Or third, that God alone speaks creatively, authoritatively and infallibly. The first view holds that man alone speaks the infallible word. There is said to be no God, or if God exists, he is a God who remains outside of man's purview. He is not God over man and universe, and is an outsider to it. Man thus has no standard beyond himself. For an existentialist such as Sartre, God is, by definition, no problem to his philosophy, but other people are. How can men, each seeking to be a God, tolerate one another? In a world of rival gods, conflict is inescapable. Sartre offers intersubjectivity as the answer, but this possibility is not developed into anything other than a hope. Man, as God, speaking the infallible word, cannot speak the word of knowledge concerning creation. Since he has no authoritative standard other than himself, he must have an exhaustive knowledge of all reality before he has any knowledge at all. Because he has denied that reality has any God-given law and order in and over it, he must examine that reality totally before he can pronounce a word of knowledge concerning it. As a result, no knowledge is possible. Nietzsche, in declaring his independence from God, was forced thereby to deny all knowledge and the idea of truth. In the end, Nietzsche annihilated everything including himself. Man became an island in a shoreless sea, hearing no voice but his own, and committed to suicide. Since life itself could not be the criterion for Nietzsche, he had to reject the life force itself finally as an alien standard and good. Suicide was thus his ultimate counsel. To deny God is ultimately to deny man, life, knowledge, and everything else. God is the only creator and sustainer of all things. When he is denied, everything is denied. The result is a world without meaning, only total negation. Few people have realised this more clearly than Karl Barth. As a thoroughly modern man, he was, in principle, opposed to the sovereign God of Scripture, who alone speaks authoritatively and creatively, and whose every word is therefore an infallible and inerrant word. Bart belonged to the world of Descartes. For him, the God of Scripture was anathema. On the other hand, Bart was horrified by the abyss opened up by Nietzsche, or, more accurately, by Feuerbach and the whole tradition of modern thought, when man alone speaks, then man is doomed. The world of suicide opens up, 
and the apocalypse of modern man in a worldwide conflict. Bart wanted neither God alone nor man alone, neither the word of God nor the word of man. Bart's hope was for something in between, something which would give man his Cartesian freedom and autonomy to speak the authoritative word in the name of God. God would thus provide the insurance policy to undergird man's word. For Bart, therefore, God is very important, not in himself, but as a foundation for man's freedom. God is, for Bart, a limiting concept, not the sovereign and omnipotent being. The result was the second possible answer, that is, that God and man are both creative and both speak creatively in Scripture. The Word of God is here in the Bible, but it is a hidden, subjective word, appearing only in the divine human encounter. It is not God in himself that interests Bart, if such a God exists. He is unknowable. He is not a matter for belief or unbelief. He is not our concern. Only a relational concept of God exists in Bart, a God whose function is to underwrite man. The liberal theologian Wingren is right. In Bart's theology, man is the obvious centre. The question about man's knowledge is the axis around which the whole subject matter moves. He adds that this is very plainly manifested in what Bart has to say about God's law. Bart's concern was not salvation. He was too much a universalist for that. His concern was with saving the possibility of knowledge. His man is modern man. Man in epistemological crisis, not biblical man. Bart's man is without a biblical doctrine of sin. Rather, he is modern man, who has a problem establishing how he can know, and who has a desire for knowledge without responsibility. The Bible, for Bart, is simply a means whereby man can establish his own word in the name of God, It is not the infallible word of the God whose law is binding upon man. It is man's word for parts which must be spoken and must be heard. But, as Wiengren notes, Man, without means of contact with God, is not the kind of man described in the biblical writings. This man without means of contact with God is the modern, atheistic man for whom the question of knowledge is the one essential question whenever the conception of God is discussed. For Bart, sin is the impossible possibility, a notion which makes formal use of the doctrine of sin, but preserves man in his autonomy and freedom. Man and God have one being for Bart. Man's fall, thus, is not from something ordained by the absolute God, but from himself. Salvation is not new life, but new knowledge, and it is, in essence, a rise in the scale of being. Bart's language is one of encounter and correspondence, not atonement and salvation. Rudolf Bultmann tried also to preserve man from the abyss of self-deification. His answer was to demythologize scripture to gain the true word. He began by declaring that the scientific worldview must be strictly accepted. Anything which purports to come from the eternal realm is strictly mythological. By demythologizing scripture, we can then recognize that realized eschatology is its true message. Man's religious quest must not be directed to a fixed point outside himself, but to himself and his own awareness and certainty. As Wiengren comments, In regard to the concept of guilt, we have established that a peculiar egocentricity dominates Bultmann's thinking on this point. This is due to the influence of Heidegger. Guilt is lack of self-realization, just as salvation is self-realization. Human life, Dasein, has fallen, 
but it has fallen exclusively from itself. When man searches and chooses among the possibilities which meet him in the hour of decision, he is seeking his own existence. Where does God come into the picture for Bultmann? The modern worldview of science prevails. The supernatural and the beyond are ruled out, and man is autonomous, his only hope being himself. Having done this, Bultmann appeals to security in the unseen beyond, in God. But this is the very God he has ruled out. Bultmann then turns on science and technology as the true demons who give man a false sense of security when man's true state should be no security whatsoever. Like Tillich, he affirms as the Protestant principle a perpetual insecurity, that is, a perpetual anxiety neurosis, and a St. Vitus dance in no man's land. Bultmann does not want the God of Scripture, nor his infallible word. He demythologizes it in order to strip God of all authority. It is man's word which he upholds, but, like Bart, he sees suicide inherent in man's word, so he then demythologizes man. How do we then have knowledge? Man's word is undermined to a degree, and God's word radically so. Our knowledge, which, as for Bart, is our justification, comes by demythologizing. As Bultmann wrote, Indeed, demythologizing is a task parallel to that performed by Paul and Luther in their doctrine of justification by faith alone, without the works of the law. More precisely, demythologizing is the radical application of the doctrine of justification by faith to this sphere of knowledge and thought. Like the doctrine of justification, demythologizing destroys every longing for security. There is no difference between security based on good works and security built on objectifying knowledge. The man who desires to believe in God must know that he has nothing at his own disposal on which to build this faith, that he is, so to speak, in a vacuum. He who abandons every form of security shall find the true security. Biblical man, who is not in Bultmann's vacuum, believes that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. God, as the only security, is never abandoned by biblical man, but Bultmann's man finds his security in himself. God and the unseen beyond provide him with an insurance policy and prevent man from collapsing into meaninglessness, or so Bultmann hopes. His God and man are really one, the question of God and the question of myself are identical. This is not pantheism. Bultmann's God is not real enough for that. Bultmann's God is a limiting concept. Bart and Bultmann do not rescue knowledge. They do not give us an authoritative and infallible word. Rather, in their views, God is dissolved and man is left in a void. All views which deny the sovereign God lead to what Cornelius van Til has so aptly described as an integration into the void. The third possible view is that only God speaks authoritatively and creatively, whereas man speaks analogically. Man thinks God's thoughts after him. God determines man, eternity, time, Man's role is to do God's will, to understand all things in terms of the word of God. It does not destroy history to make eternity determinative, as Reinhold Niebuhr claimed, any more than our inability to walk up the side of a wall destroys our ability to walk. Man is not God. He is God's vicegerent, called to obey God and to work out the implication of the image of God in that obedience. 
Van Til has spoken of the kinetic wish that there be no God. Instead of yielding to the kinetic wish for the death of God, we work on the premise of the absolute God in his inscriptured word. The kinetic wish seeks to eliminate God, and instead it eliminates meaning and man. Man dissolves himself into the void of meaninglessness whenever he seeks to dissolve God. Those whose theology is informed by the second approach do not preach a biblical doctrine of salvation. They preach psychology or self-salvation. Those who hold to the sovereign and triune God of Scripture have the sure and infallible word of God to proclaim. It is the word upon which all words must be founded.